Hey everyone, this is Michael Cole, VP of Marketing at Everflow. Today I'm joined from Thomas, uh, joined by Thomas from ClickBank, and we're going to be talking about what most marketers don't know about scaling affiliates. So, just to kick it off with some quick questions, um, can you give us the rundown on what your role is at ClickBank? Yeah, I'm the well now I'm the director of partnership strategy here at ClickBank. So, get us kind of tee up cool things like we're doing with Everflow here, and then. Before that, I was biz dev over here at ClickBank for four or five years. So I helped onboard a lot of our top sellers and kind of set up some channel partnerships. But yeah, I've just kind of been in the weeds deep at ClickBank for about seven years now. It's been a good time. Awesome. And how do you describe ClickBank to potential prospects? Yeah, I always like to preface it with the kind of the end result for our clients, right? Which is we help clients scale customer acquisition through affiliate marketing. And people always like to ask, how do you do that? Well, we're kind of the back end connection of all that. So we help the money flow, the tracking. We make sure the affiliates are paid on time every time. We have a robust network and marketplace where your offer can be featured for new affiliates to find your offer. You know, the fraud vetting and analysis for those affiliates and the transactions that come through and just kind of make sure the money flows to the right places and that you can scale your business like you need to. Cool. And in the past week, what are one to two tasks that have taken up the most of your time and focus? I think it's always really interesting to like, see like a little picture into like how people oh, nice. yeah. like have their time eaten up. <laughs> well, this, this is a funny example. I guess I was in New York for affiliate summit East where I got COVID. So the last two weeks was a bit weird where I was trying to go to a conference I could go to half of and then recovering from COVID. Um, but in reality, right, last two weeks has been a lot of strategy around kind of the foundation that we've been building on a partnership, partnership side over here. Um, kind of a personal mind shift set for me going from like an individual contributor in the biz dev role to more of a director role, kind of managing a team and kind of the processes and standing up a new team over here has been a bigger mental shift and so a lot of those kind of behind the scenes things of actually, it's like, oh, cool. We don't have any of these resources. Who's going to build this <laughs> and figuring all that out. It's been a lot of fun. So not too specific there, but it's been a lot of hats. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always an endless challenge of switching to managing and all the, all the little quirks that come out of that. Uh, I'm, I'm the biggest shell for this just because we use it super heavily on our partnership side, but um, are you using Crossbeam yet? You know, you're the third company that's mentioned that. I had no idea about it before. So I think we're definitely looking into that. <laughs> it's, it's just one of those things that like any partnerships, it's just so much easier because what it does is very simple. You just sort of like map your two like CRM list together. And then it says mm -hmm. like, okay, here's your shared customers. Here are companies that are your prospects that are their customers. So it's just like sort of like, even if you're not working with them in terms of referrals, like it still helps to just be like, okay here are joint things that like we can build around like these existing customers and figure out other ways to like get value. Yeah. I'm sure it un uncovers some like, Oh, I didn't realize we had either that much or that little overlap. So <laughs> yeah, we've had a few yeah. companies who, like they'd never heard of us and we never heard of them. It turned out like there was like 50 companies overlapping. You're like, how, <laughs> That's awesome. how, how do I not know who you are? <laughs> <laughs> cool. And what led you, uh, what led to you joining ClickBank in the first place? Gosh, yeah. Um, I don't know if you've met Brett Chesney over here. He manages our events team now. Um, but I've worked with him for, I think, over a decade. Um, and we were, we we both got our, cut our teeth in internet marketing at a link building firm here in Boise, Idaho at Page One Power. And we both started making minimum wage, writing guest blogs on the internet, building backlinks, and kind of started from there. We both kind of worked our way up. I was managing a team over there. And he left for ClickBank a year or two before, um, and he was just kind of hitting me up going, hey, this place is pretty cool. You should you should look at it. And then it took me another year to actually get hired over here um, and joined over as the account management side. And it was just one of those places I, I'd kind of ascended up to where I could at a startup, and mm -hmm. I kind of made the lateral move, I thought, but it ended up being a very good move career-wise for me to join over at ClickBank. And it's been, yeah, very good thing since then, so. Not to mention that link building is just so much work. It's a grind, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The SEO agency work, I, I don't miss it. I do miss the people I work with over there, but 
yeah, the client facing work and just the way Google can shut something down, working direct response and direct to consumer now is a lot more in our control. Even if things like Facebook change something, right. You'd still have a lot more control over what you're doing. Yeah. Cool. So let's hop into like some longer form discussion topics. So first off, um, like just to kick it off with a good starting question, what are the most common reasons that keep affiliate pro programs from being successful? Oh gosh. Well, I mean, honestly the offer first of all like if you don't have a good offer which means something with a specific pain point you're solving for that converts at a good enough level and pays at a high enough rate and all of those are vague and variable because they are but as long as the offer is good there should be success mm -hmm. air quotes right so i guess one of the most common reason why they don't take off is that the offer is bad and people don't realize it. <laughs> and it's, uh, their baby's ugly and you have to tell them that and then they have to go back to the drawing board and fix something major with their offer structure, the economics of their offer. So assuming, yeah, we, we can chat more about that or we can go into more of those pieces, but it's uh, that's the main one. I think it's a good summary. And yeah, I think it's always worth hammering home that just like, if you're going to work with affiliates, but even with any type of partnership, there has to be results fast because whoever you're working with on the other side, like they are taking the risk of like either they're actually spending money in the case of like media buyers, they're using their own traffic if they have like their own networks or relationships, or even with a partnership, like it takes up a lot of time and effort. Yeah. So if they don't see results fast, they're not going to be successful. And if you don't have something that's proven, with traffic outside of your friends and family, where it's someone who doesn't know you that well and it's converting, you just can't make it successful at all. So I think that's a good thing to mention right now to sort of frame <laughs> where we're gonna go into in terms of like the actual operations and the yeah. ways to make this successful because it is the reality, it's what people don't understand about affiliate is that you have one shot because they are taking the risk on, because it's a cost-effective channel. Right. And people right, will come on and go, Hey, I've got an offer. I'm ready for affiliates to test it. Right. And it's like, well, have you tested it all yourself? It's like, well, no, like I thought affiliates, affiliates would do that. Like, why would they take that burden on? Why would they take all that risk on? We haven't tested into marketing yet. And kind of hear an awkward pregnant pause. And it's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's like, yeah, here's so yeah, you need to kind of test it yourself, get it off the ground. And some other big reasons why they don't have success, assuming the offers in a good spot would be back in operations are a mess where there's no one to actually manage affiliates. I think a misnomer is that people think you can put an offer on a network like ClickBank or any other network and just expect affiliates to take it and run with it. That can happen. And it's usually the offers that are just so good that they're almost can't fail where it happens. But most of us aren't gonna have that type of offer. So like, do you actually have someone to manage those affiliates and network with them? Do you have the biz dev mindset around that? Can you actually get that taking off? Do you have a program that's actually set up to track well and pay well on time every time? Like what are these pieces that are gonna make sure you can have ongoing success and actually put focus towards it? That's where I see a lot of affiliate programs that are like, oh yeah, we pay 5% commission and you have to sign up through this vague portal and there's no clear way that of how I'm gonna get paid. And they're curious as to why affiliates make up like 1% of their overall sales. It's like, well, you've not dedicated really anything to this program to merely help it grow. Yeah, I would also argue that uh, if your offer can work with just launching it on a, a network or partnership like that, then it's such a successful offer already from all your other channels mm -hmm. that you should just hire an affiliate manager. <laughs> yep. And if you can't afford an affiliate manager and you don't have you're not willing to work with an agency or network or anyone else that is basically acting as the agency for you or the affiliate manager, then it's not time for this channel yet. This is affiliate marketing in particular is definitely like a secondary channel. It's sort of like you prove it out and then they just add rocket fuel in a very cost-effective way because it's like, you know that you have as much success with the expertise you have in-house. Now it's time to let other experts promote it and also have that same success. Yeah. Yeah. And there are, there are ways like we, we operate with quite a few people where affiliates are one of their main channels, if not their main channel. And the way they can do that is through some proven success of past offers that they know how to launch and kind of scale that way. 
Um, but a lot of it is that they just kind of know how to work with people. They might do list rentals versus asking someone to do a cold, like just pure performance-based send to their email list or something like that. So they kind of know how to pay to play with those affiliates first. And they, can kinda, they almost treat them like a media channel to start until the ball's rolling downhill and then more affiliates are piling on to promote a good offer that's more proven. Yeah, and that requires a lot of expertise, which is yeah. basically mm -hmm. like someone who is an affiliate manager, even if that's not their full-time role anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. So what are the main verticals that ClickBank focuses on and why those verticals? Yeah. So it's funny, like we focus on what our clients focus on, which is what the market dictates a little bit. So we are truly a platform where we do have some guidelines, right, that we kind of play, put out there. So people are marketing in a compliant way for the FTC and things like that. But the market has really dictated that, you know, direct response, which is our core bread and butter clientele, right? It's kind of the health, wealth, and relationships, those big kind of pain point niches. So health and fitness is by far our biggest vertical. Then you go into like, how can I be more successful? How can I make more money? How can I advance my career? Whatever it might be and kind of self-help, if you will, niche is pretty big. Relationships is a big one. How can I find the love of my life? How can I meet the girl? Um, how can I meet the guy? That kind of vertical. And then all kinds of things from there. Like, you start looking at the sub niches of those and the hobbyist space actually becomes really compelling. Like when woodworking has been a surprisingly large niche on ClickBank, right? <laughs> Things like that, sewing patterns, <laughs> like uh, gardening and the different kind of ways that you kind of shape that. Sometimes it's gardening with like a health focus on it where you can kind of grow your own products and things like that. So it's, we let our clients kind of put the offers out there. And then if they take off and scale, that's kind of where we grow. We do look at other channels where it's like, okay, what other types of verticals do we need to operate better in? And those are things where we've made big grounds and say like the online course creation space, which any of those courses might serve one of those verticals. It's more the product type and the medium of that product and how we're helping to serve those people with those types of products, or it's the e-commerce space, or it's more physical goods, which we've grown tremendously in the last six years. So it's like, how can we play better in those types of pawns and those types of sellers versus an overall vertical and the vertical often dictates by the market, which is in a direct response fashion. If you were going to launch your own product on ClickBank, uh, where would you focus your limited resources of like launching from scratch? Like what would be the thing that you would want to perfect? So I, are you so I guess I should ask you, are you asking me personally or like if I was giving someone advice on what they should do? Well, there's like a hypothetical situation yeah, yeah. of just sort of like, where <laughs> would you focus if you had to do it yourself? So I think the... I, me personally, I always look at, and when I tell my clients who ask me this too, it's like the onus that you have, you can either be the marketer that chases something that you think is going to make a lot of money, or you can chase a need in the market that will likely make you a lot of money because you're solving for that need. And that's what I like to go after. When that leads me to is I think the women's health space is still vastly underserved directly. We've seen that we've seen some big offers take off in that vertical for that same reason. Um, like seeing what my wife went through and we're trying to conceive a child, for example, or when we you know we're dealing with a newborn baby, like, and then just the economics of that model. If you're selling to new parents, for example, you've got someone with a newborn or with a toddler that you can now remarket to in a very helpful way for the lifetime. Um, Love Every is a brand that's based at Boise here that's grown tremendously. They're not a ClickBank, but it's just one of those brands that they started with newborn kind of like a play kit. And they've rolled out their product line to the point where it's like up to like five years old now and you're on some of these subscription boxes and they could be selling up till their teens at this point, <laughs> not that they will, but I really like that niche or it'd be a hobbyist kind of product. Someone who's got a hobby that they're passionate about um, and they want to be better at it or know how to get into it, whether it's golf or sewing patterns or, you know, whatever it might be. So it'd either be a hobbyist space or like a women's health kind of focus space. It sounds like your, your recommendation would be like to choose the right product as like the most important thing to focus on. Yeah, we did a we did a podcast interview with Perry Belcher that hasn't launched yet all around kind of like offer creation and product creation, right? And it's really going out there and identifying the needs in the market, which are often from your own needs, but actually validating that with some survey, you know, doing some surveys, doing some asking questions to the businesses out there. Um, right. If it's a software, what are people using Excel for that you can actually make a software for that's way better, but it's like identifying those needs in the market and solving and then building a product. I've tried with so many people that went and built a product and then they're trying to figure out how to market it when 
you should probably approach that from that flip point of view and actually see like, okay, what's out there? What can I do better? And if there's competition, great. That's kind of proven that there's a market for you out there already that you can go make something better in. And what's your podcast name? Uh, affiliated. Thanks for wearing the shirt. Sweet. Yeah, affiliated by ClickBank. So you can just look up ClickBank. Mm -hmm. That is convenient. Cool. Yeah. I, I have a 16 month old, so I've gone through this and it's definitely like, if you find underserved niche, it's also very powerful. Like mm -hmm. there's like a Kara babies, which is like this like hundred dollar, like video series. And just like, there's so much word of mouth that any of these products that people actually like, like the viralness of it is significant because it's just, as you mentioned, it's underserved and every parent's like, why didn't they tell me more? Yeah, right. And there's a lot of misconceptions out there. There's people like our parents told us that, oh yeah, rub whiskey on their gums. It's like, no, don't do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? No, we've had like how to help toddler, help how to help babies sleep products that sell really well on ClickBank, for example. Right. So any of these like kind of niche pain points that people experience, it's like, how do I do this? Can really help, whether it's like a teething product or whether it's you know lactation support, whether if it's a supplement or something like that. Like, what can you do that has good profit margin that really adds value to that person, solves a big pain point in their life right now that you can kind of build a customer and an offer around? Awesome. So you have an immense amount of experience with the operational structure of affiliate programs. So let's dive into some of the specifics of that. Mm -hmm. So first off, how should commissions be structured to make a program successful? Yeah. No, I always like to ask people when they ask like, how much should I pay an affiliate? It's like, how much can you afford not to pay an affiliate if you're going to miss out on customers, right? And your customer acquisition volume. Um, so it, this really di is, this is dictated by two things. It's dictated by the market. Like what are your competitors doing with affiliates? And when you look at your competitors, what they're doing affi with affiliates, don't be make sure you dig in and make sure they're actually doing volume with their affiliate programs. So you're not copying something that isn't working. There's a lot of bad affiliate programs out there. And if you just like, Oh yeah, we're going to do 7% versus their 5%. Right. You're, you're not really making up any ground there because the overall market. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So a specific question on that, like how do you recommend actually getting some sense of the volume of their affiliate program? Cause I mean, I know it from the, the old school when I did um, agency work at like affiliate management, like, with like the CJs and impacts of the world, you used to be able to see sort of which programs mm -hmm. had the highest payout amounts. Uh, that gets harder and harder to see that that sort of data. So how do you recommend actually getting an idea if like this affiliate program for a competitor actually has anyone promoting it? Yeah, so I'll, I'll plug the ClickBank marketplace here. If you go sign up for a ClickBank account and go to our marketplace, you just, and just hit the search button without really searching for anything in particular, you see a stack ranking based on performance. And the, the way we stack rank, there's a lot of variables that go into it, but the main one is how many affiliates are getting sales from this product. Right. And so we don't tell you, tell you there's like X many affiliates. We put this arbitrary gravity number on there, which factors in some other things over a 12 week timeline. But we're trying to show other affiliates that, hey, other affiliates are having success with this product. It's selling well. Um, and you can go by niche and look down at different niches and kind of get an idea of ones that are doing better than others. And it's all right. A good gravity score in one niche isn't a bad gravity score in another niche necessarily. It's kind of dependent on the size of that niche, but that's a good way to look at it. Another way would be using some of the spy tools out there. If you ask me specific ones, I'll forget all of them on the top of my head, but different spy tools out there and looking at what your competitors are doing, because um, you'll get, likely get a good idea of not just their internal media buying, but you'll get an idea of affiliates that are promoting them. And something to keep in mind too, is if you're looking at doing competitive research, look at what type of ads you're just naturally getting when you're getting retargeted, like on Facebook and Instagram and Google and things like that. in the different niches, a lot of it will be internal media, like internal stuff, but a decent chunk you'll start seeing will be affiliate plays, or especially if it's organic stuff, you might be seeing review sites that are out there. And like, are they actually getting good search traffic? You can use SEM rush for things like that. Right. And so you can start to get an idea of who's getting some decent volume from affiliates that way. Yeah, I want to mention one more on that. It's just, yeah. if they're doing retargeting and you can't find any investors behind them or anything else that would allow them to lose money on this, that's also like a good example. If they can afford to do a lot of paid media, which is very expensive, and you know that they're not just burning money because they're trying to grow super fast, that's obviously someone who's worth like seeing what they've done right. Yep. And the looking specifically at it, right? Like, I think a lot of people get sticker shock when they see 
in the direct to consumer space, how much people are actually paying to acquire in a customer, which also includes how much they're paying affiliates. I think a misconception people have is that affiliates are cheap. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not really the case anymore if you want to build a scaled affiliate program. And I kind of think of it this way. Do you want to build a commission structure that is exciting and incentivizing? Or do you want to act more of like a passive thank you for sending mm -hmm. something? And a lot of what I see is people building these like, oh, thanks kind of commission structures versus something that's going to go, okay, I can make a lot of money doing this, like promoting this. This should be great. Because at the end of the day, yes, your product should be great and serve a market. But if there's two similar products that I could be promoting as an affiliate and one pays me quite a bit more, converts better, I'm obviously going to go promote that one. So that's where you start to eat up the wallet share, if you will, in the space from affiliates. If you want, we can throw out some like rough percentages. It does depend a lot on niche and product type. But like if I look at like the supplement space, for example, where a bottle might be selling for let's say a single bottle selling in the 50 to $60 range, they might be bundling down to a $30 bottle. If you take six, their AOVs usually get into the 150 to $300 range. That's quite a variable, but that's kind of where the top offers trend. They're probably paying 60 to 85% to affiliates on that acquisition. So the affiliates are making, you know, 90 to 150 bucks kind of per sale um, on a give and take for those supplement pieces. So if you've got an e-commerce store where your AOV is $50, you're going to be going, oh, okay, how do I play with that? And your program might start to look like either more of an influencer campaign, or you're going to go, how do I make an actually good high AOV converting front end offer versus more of an e-commerce shopping experience that might be more add to cart. So like, how do you actually drive a front end day zero sale versus maybe more e-commerce example? Yep. I think the other thing to mention there is that if you can't compete right now with your offer as you mentioned maybe rework the offer but also that's where things like pushing subscriptions and having ongoing revenue where you're paying the affiliate a lot up front because they're taking the upfront risk but then you're benefiting from all of the subscription revenue on the back end like tracking that stuff and building your offers around that really helps you compete against competitors that aren't looking at this data and don't have that kind of structure a hundred percent. When I qualify people, if they've got a good thing for affiliates, it's like, you know, what's your front end price point? What's your initial AOV? What's your conversion rate on that? What's your total AOV, including upsells? If total AOV isn't a multiplier of initial AOV, there's probably meat on the bone because you're not offering good upsells that people can take. What's your customer lifetime value compared to your initial or your overall AOV? And if that customer lifetime value is a multiplier of AOV, there's a big hole there in your business where you're leaving a lot of profit on the table. People are going, well, I don't have any other products to sell. It's like, well, you could be an affiliate. You could be an affiliate yourself to your customers. If you don't have good products to sell and figure out what works and then go make another product to upsell later. It could be a high ticket coaching. It could be all kinds of things. Cause if you, yeah, if you don't have that LTV or subscription or other ways to get that, you're going to struggle to pay enough to any traffic source affiliate or Facebook or whatever it is to actually acquire that customer at scale. Yeah. I think that's also a great, point that doesn't get mentioned enough is that as you start to become more in the trenches successful with this sort of stuff you realize that there's a ton of opportunity to cross promote each other if you're both in the same space and you're not like angry competitors or you like have very <laughs> synergistic stuff it's very easy to add that as an additional thing as an upsell and i mean especially like that's the the neutral world and health and stuff like that but also it's a huge part of b2b as well is oh, 100%, there's yep. a ton of synergy between companies and that's a really easy way to get more value out of every customer that you're paying to get in the door yep and that's yeah people are often surprised like who are the biggest affiliates often they're the biggest sellers <laughs> they're, they're remarketing to their customers other affiliate offers and a little, a little hack there too, is if you're comfortable being an affiliate with your customer base, that's a great way to warm up the waters with potential affiliates yourself, right? If you can be an affiliate first and kind of warm up those waters, it's a much different conversation going, will you please promote my product to, hey, we're doing some good business together already. What else can we do together? It's a way different conversation that can go a lot further than just you asking for a give, which is traffic, right? I just want to start there to go back because that's such a fascinating idea to retarget your customers 
with other relevant offers. I haven't heard that before, but of course it's genius. Like, you know that they're the right fit for these other offers. Yeah. That's a really easy way to, to bring up revenue. And I'm sure that that's probably applicable to a lot of companies in a lot of spaces that are not doing this. And I can, I can sense people who are listening to this. I can sense that some of their, their hackles going up on that. Cause people like to really protect their customer list and they've built this thing. And it's like, if you're not making, I, I, I look at it in three chunks. If you're not making a lot of your, well, you can look at it like three pies in my point of view, and this is overly simplified, but if 30% of your revenue isn't coming from your email list, huge lever to pull there. <laughs> and so if you're going, well, I don't have any other products to sell. The natural thing you can do is be an affiliate and that can warm it up. You might go, Oh, I can't, I can't bastardize my list or whatever it is. Right. I can't like send things to my list or third party. You can, right. You can do it in a structured way. That's still branded. That's still very helpful to that list. You don't have to beat them over the head with an affiliate stuff. I think people have this negative connotation. Sometimes I'd always like to address about affiliate overall but you can play in the affiliate space by being an affiliate yourself, even if you are branded kind of a experience online for your customers. Yeah. And we've been seeing that, especially with say podcasts where mm-hmm. podcasts are always promoting stuff and a lot of them do it in their own voice and they're authentically promoting something that like they are comfortable with sharing. And I think that's just it. Like it's not a problem to promote other stuff as long as you're doing it in an authentic way. And I mean, you should definitely be asking like, hey, can I try the product first? Can I make sure that this does make sense and that I can feel passionate about that? But as long as you have that, then it's no longer an authentic promotion. It's something that you can be like, I genuinely think that I know that just theoretically, this should be a product you like. And now I've tested this product and I know that it is what it says it is. So if you want to try it out, because I think it's a good fit for the people that like us, here you go. Mm-hmm. 100%. Cool. So what, when launching a program, what sort of assets should they have in place before they uh, like get started? Yeah. I always like to make sure, okay, we'll assume the offer is good and like it's proven and tests and all that kind of stuff. Um, some of the different assets you'll need are like an actual affiliate. I call it recruitment page. Other people call it like an affiliate tools page. Um, where you're giving affiliates the resources that they can use to promote it, which could be banner ads, could be email swipes, it could be pre-landers you've made for them, all kinds of things like that. I think the misnomer is that if you just focus on the tools, you don't sell enough to the affiliate and why they should promote this product. So that's why I like to call it an affiliate recruitment page. And this is where I see a lot of people screw up where they're just like, They assume if someone's clicking on like an affiliate link on their footer, or if they're finding an affiliate link on ClickBank or another network, they assume the affiliates like already sold on promoting them when really this affiliate is probably just exploring options. And that's where you want to highlight, this is a great offer for this type type of demographic. It's a sales page to the affiliate. So you want to qualify and disqualify the affiliates you don't want. So, right, does this do well with women over 45 that does well with business people like in this kind of demographic? Who does it convert really well with? But the affiliates kind of make the decision if it's going to be good or not for them. You can put social proof in there, what other affiliates have made, like what kind of conversions they can expect, what kind of payouts they can expect, how they're going to get paid, right? What frequency they're going to get paid. Um, This is all things that, you know, ClickBank can solve for a lot of that, but people still mention it on their affiliate tools page because people could be finding that through Google or something versus just their ClickBank uh, link, for example. Um, And then from there, right, then you can start to offer the resources after someone's kind of sold on that page, or you can be kind of collecting leads. And this is where I like to look at the operations of a business. And this is kind of looking at what do you actually need to launch it? Um, You need someone in that affiliate manager role. That could be you if you're a solopreneur, but you need someone to own the business development side of affiliate relations, which is who's following up with those leads from that recruitment page. Who's going to affiliate summit East and West and traffic and conversion to mix and mingle and to the ClickBank networking road shows, right? Who's going to these places to the Everflow event you guys are hosting next week, right? Like who's going to mix and mingle and meet potential traffic partners. And if you don't have someone to do that, you're, you just need to understand that you're going to have a slower burn to success than if you had someone dedicated to that role. When you start looking at that role, are they actually incentivized to grow? Are they a biz dev aligned affiliate manager? Do they get a percent of sales they bring in? 
Do they have a commission structure? Do they have clear guidelines and the deals they can cut? If they have to keep going to you for everything and you're slowing everything down, that's a problem, right? Do they have a copywriter that can help them make assets for the affiliates that can roll out tests based on what they're seeing in the market? Because the affiliate manager is the boot on the ground, so to speak. They're going to see a lot of other things that are working well or not working well that they can come to you to test. Do they have tech support to help with putting custom landers up or to make sure tracking's working or to kind of get the affiliate a custom parameter on a page or something like that, right? Like what are these things? Basically, do they have the resources they need? Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned before, if you already have a great offer, that's probably something you can hire confidently around and just kind of, now we're gonna dive into affiliates and kind of get this thing off the ground. If it's more startup and you're not sure, you can just start with one of those pieces being the affiliate manager but you're just gonna have to make sure that they can have some of those resources at their disposal in somewhat of a timely manner. And mm -hmm. that you actually have that dedicated over to them. And it's, they're not just off on this like silo that I think you mentioned, right? <laughs> it's like on this Island. And that's where both everyone gets frustrated. Definitely. Definitely. And I think that's a really interesting point of just having your affiliate sign up page be like a sales page that's selling them on why the offer is great. And you mentioned things like having, the, who's the target audience, et cetera. And I know for like a lot of the affiliate programs I manage, like I, I definitely never did that. And I think it's genius, but also, I mean, why would I bother? Because if I'm just working with coupon websites and some, <laughs> yeah. um, a handful of content affiliates that basically just create specialized pages around product lines, they don't need to know who the audience is, but especially as you're going to more diverse partners and reaching like a, a larger uh, affiliates that have more levers to move rather than just like a single website, these things really matter. And so I think that just goes naturally into sort of, can you talk a little bit about sort of what are the main types of affiliates that ClickBank works with um, for promoting customers? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I call them performance marketers. <laughs> I don't know if that's what they would call themselves, but the reason why I call them that is like you alluded to, an affiliate can be a number of different things, right? And how they're operating, how they're actually promoting. There's more ways to promote an offer than there's ways to count, right? It's insane. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're looking at like coupon sites or content or like, like a YouTuber, a blogger or influencer kind of programs, that's a different type of affiliate than I typically work with. What I work with is someone who's very return on investment and business oriented going, I have a traffic source what's going to get me the biggest ROI with this traffic source while maintaining it. So the quality has to be good enough. Right. And that traffic source is often an email list that they've cultivated or built through either products have sold themselves or leads they have generated somewhere. Um, but it's some sort of email list that they're now marketing to, or it's someone who's running ads on Facebook, on Instagram, on Google, on YouTube, on TikTok, on native ad platforms. Right. And they're profiting on the return on the ad spend they're getting from the commission piece. And that's where these high commissions often come into play, but they also come into play because the competitive nature of the affiliate space has come up quite a bit. And I'd say the last decade, right. It used to be you can kind of put something out there and the good affiliates who knew what they're doing could get traction, but now it's pretty competitive in every sense of the word. Um, and more and more expensive on the affiliate side. So yeah, they, they have to be better and they need to make sure that when they make it successful, um, that it's paying the bills. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's where you see affiliates gravitate towards a network. Um, because if you look at it from like a affiliate point of view, if I've got this, let's say I've got a 500,000 person email list that I monetize, right? Um, I know on average what I make per week or per month. So if I put a new offer into that cycle, which I need to do, because I need to keep things fresh for my email list. So I need to test new offers. But if I put something in that's unproven, it's, it's not risky in the sense that I'm going to go to business necessarily, but I've maybe lost money compared to what I could have made promoting a more proven offer. So it's an opportunity cost and I have to pay my ESP. I have to pay my staff. I have to pay myself, right? There's all these things I have to cover. So when I drop in revenue on a weekly basis, it does affect me as an affiliate. The other piece is if I'm an affiliate that's running lean, either as a solopreneur or the very small team, if I have to now go to 500, you know, different affiliate programs 
and sign up to get the tracking link from them, figure out how often I'm going to get paid by them, keep track of that somehow, go actually make sure they're paying me. <laughs> that becomes a very big burden for them. So they are going to want to really know what that structure is on that affiliate recruitment page. So they know if it's worth their time going for or not. And that's where they might just want to go to a ClickBank or a MaxWeb. And those are going to be their main two places they promote offers from because now they're going to get two payments versus 500 ones that they might be missing 30 of, right? They know they'll get paid by these networks and that's why they, they prefer a network. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it, I mean, just what you mentioned of like media buyers and emailers, um, I can tell you from personal experience that when I was running programs on like CJ and impact, like mm -hmm. those, those exist, the, especially on the media buying side, they used to exist, but they don't exist anymore because at least when I was mm -hmm. doing it, media buying was so much less expensive that it was still possible to make work. But every single year that I was involved with that, and I did it for five years, like there were less and less of them. And the reason for that is something that I am harping on again and again, because I think it's just the most important thing to understand for so many affiliate programs is that if you're in the e-commerce space, the top affiliates in most of these networks are all coupon related, coupon websites, coupon extensions, et cetera. And the traffic sources that you mentioned, like media buying and email, they are either paying for traffic or using their direct relationships and they can't mm -hmm. afford to have 75% of their sales um, being lost because someone was about to purchase, they saw a little promo code box, they couldn't help their curiosity, even if they had a coupon to see if they can get a better deal. As soon as they went to a coupon website, that coupon website is firing off their own affiliate link and it's taking credit from the yeah. original affiliates um, source. So now the coupon website gets a credit when the user buys and the original media buyer that spent a bunch of money to get that person in the door gets no credit. So yeah, we'll I think call it cookie that, stuffing, right? They're just trying to get that last click. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, and they have the SEO for it. So it's like, they're easy to find when you're searching at the last second or with coupon extensions, they're even more shady where it's just like, <laughs> they basically will force their way in if you have that extension installed. Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with like the e-commerce side, like, I mean, one of the advantages with the products that you tend to promote, like there's not that coupon user experience, so it's more protected, but it's also why if you're going to work with these types of affiliates on an e-commerce program, you need to have um, a coupon protection strategy. You need to make sure that if say like a user clicks on an ad and then purchases within a minute of clicking on an ad or clicking on a link, that you're not crediting that affiliate in that situation because like they did not complete a full shopping decision in a minute. Like that only <laughs> happens because they had yeah. already completed their shopping decision. And then an affiliate last second got involved and fired off their tracker and now they're getting credit. So just always keep this in mind. Like it's essential for to have coupon protections. If you're going to be working in any space that has coupons, because again, like, there are many places where they are the ones also driving shoppers. They have a lot of loyalty and membership, but you need to make sure you're protecting your media buyers and your emailers, everyone else that really has to work hard to get that traffic in the door. Yeah. And so from your perspective, how do you think about doing this sort of protection of your affiliates to make sure that if they are an awesome affiliate, like they're actually getting reward for the effort. And I'm sure you still run into issues where sure. there are multiple affiliates involved. So how do you think about the best way to handle that? Yeah. So, I mean, if you're doing affiliates at scale, there's no way around it. There's going to be some cookies that drop. There's going to be some people that get the last click when they arguably didn't deserve it. Right. There's going to be people that generate the initial interest that don't get commission for it. Like it's impossible to clean it up hundred percent. And that's why some people just don't play with affiliates because they, don't like that murkiness of it. Um, it is a name, you know, it is just part of doing business. And most of scale affiliates understand that, right? That some things get lost and they'll probably get commissioned when they arguably shouldn't have in some cases because <laughs> they sent the email after someone saw 14 ads, right? <laughs> like, exactly. oh yeah, that's cool. Um, so it's funny because like in our, we operate a lot in the direct response space and a lot of our clients and our core user base don't rely on any coupons. They hate coupons. They don't want to attract a buyer that comes in because they got a deal. They want to attract a buyer that's going to pay quote unquote full price. But what they'll do is they'll, they'll value stack really well on the sales page. 
and they'll offer that, hey, this is valued at X, but you're going to get it for Y. So they'll give the implied discount, if you will, from the sales page there, um, or they'll append a coupon if at all, right from that sales page, it's already applied versus like having that generic coupon box that you can go then search for. So they're trying to keep that behavior at a minimum. Um, and what we're talking about too, is a lot of ClickBank works in a world where it's a lot of what I call day zero sales, where, right, it's happening where it's not like a multi-touch point sale process. It's where someone's getting, it's seeing an ad, getting an email, and then they're going off and going to that landing page and going, wow, yeah, I really need and want this because this is exactly who it's for. It's for me. And they're buying right then. They're not going and getting retargeted 14 times by a brand and then buying. So in that case, the cookie stuffing doesn't happen as much there because it's like more of an emotional buying process than say, oh yeah, I did need that lamp, right? I'll buy it now. Um, it's much more something that's going to help me fix a problem that is very pertinent to myself. And that's why I talk about offer creation versus product is the offer solving that problem to go more deeper into it. Like looking ClickBank is last touch attribution too, right? So if you're an affiliate, we set in someone clicks on your link, that person is for a better lack of a better term cookied. We don't just rely on cookies. We have a bunch of ways that we track somebody, uh, but they're cookied for 60 days. And if they purchase within the 60 days, the affiliate earns that commission. Um, but what's likely going to happen is like, yeah, they might find an SEO site. They might click on a review link. They might lose that initial kind of thing. Um, and that's where if you're a seller set up your affiliate program, you need to kind of decide how much control you want over that. Because there is some risk that is inherent of working with affiliates. You're basically giving up marketing control to 1099 contractors that you haven't necessarily hired. <laughs> so there's some inherent risk to that. By default in ClickBank, for an example, you are set up to um, be wide open in the network. So anyone with a ClickBank account can promote your offer. You can also be more gated where you're still in the marketplace, but affiliates have to go apply through like an affiliate recruitment page, like I was describing before. You're gonna collect their lead. You're gonna vet them somehow what, based on whatever needs you need to vet them. Um, and then you're going to add their ClickBank account to a commission group you've set up in your account. And then they get a working tracking link, right? And that might, that's where a lot of people kind of filter out that stuff they don't want, which might be those SEO sites, a negative review site. It might be that kind of like retargeting Google bidding right? Or like a brand bid keywords, for example. So they might kind of be weeding out as much as they can initially. So they don't have to deal with that problem retroactively as it's happening. And then they're just working with affiliates they want to work with. Cool. And so where do you actually see like media buyers fitting in, in terms of like a growth strategy? Because mm, I, I yeah. mean, as okay. you were mentioning, brand bidding is like a great example of that. Like there's definitely competition there, but obviously like having someone who completely lives buying from one channel is always going to be probably better than even anyone you can hire in house for owning that vertical. So sort of where should those types of affiliates fit into growth and how do you think about it? Yeah. Are you, are you alluding to, I think you are, but you're kind of alluding to the brands are like, Oh, we don't want anyone to do media buying because we do that in house yes. and we don't want to compete with affiliates. That kind of friction point that pops up. Yeah. It pops up for almost every call I have. Um, I always dig into their data, right? It's like, okay, well, how much are you spending on Facebook a day? Right? Like how much revenue are actually doing on these channels you don't want affiliates to run on? And if it's not like, <laughs> like a, a healthy eight figures, um, there's probably meat on the bone for affiliates to help you versus hurt you. Right. And it's like, that's where, like you just mentioned, we've got affiliates that are running purely on these channels day in and day out. And they've got the agency accounts on Facebook. They can spend, you know, six figures plus a day on these channels. They can really make it work when the data backs out for them and makes it work. It's like, do you really not want access to that kind of person? that's a tough business decision to make. You probably do. Uh, or, okay, let's say you are doing going big on Facebook um, and you're really established there. That's 80% of your customer generation. Sure. Okay. Maybe you don't want to compete on that front with other affiliates, but what are you doing on native? What are you doing on TikTok? What are you doing on Instagram? That's kind of rolled into Facebook, but oftentimes it's not right. There's all these experts in these different 
channels and categories that you're probably are a minor part of your overall customer acquisition that you could grow into. And the way um, my coworker, Kyle Kasechka kind of made this metaphor that I really liked, like working with affiliates is kind of split testing at massive scale when it's all working. Cause you're not just split testing copy. You're now getting split testing across all these different traffic channels and all these different tactics that you had no idea about. And that's where an active affiliate manager can really help. Cause they're going to be chatting with these people and figuring out what they're doing and learning about what they're doing. They're like, oh man, this strategy they're doing on native is really cool. Let's incentivize them more. Let's work with them closer. How can we get them custom landers? How can we, and then you almost treat it like a performance only agency at, at scale, right? With these kind of bigger media buyers. And that's where it can get really exciting. And then how can you keep it rolling? I don't know if that answered directly, but that's kind of how I start to have those conversations with people when they're like, don't want to do media buying affiliates. It's like, hey, your offer to be candid probably isn't good enough for most media buying affiliates because <laughs> they need a high conversion, high paying. But if it is, do you really not want to chat with someone who might be able to drive a hundred customers, 500 customers, a thousand, 4,000 customers a day? Like you probably would want to have that conversation. And not to mention that affiliates versus agencies, like if you have an agency doing this media buying on your behalf, they're incentivized towards the amount of spend because they tend to take a cut of spend. Mm -hmm. Whereas the affiliate needs to make these drive sales. So they're often driving the most relevant traffic because they need every dollar they spend to drive more conversions. So it's also high quality places you may not be reaching. Yep. And that that's where like uh, cash flow gets really important, right? Because we're talking about scaled media buying. These media buyers are probably only making five to 20% ROAS, right? So like the, the margins aren't huge because Facebook's expensive. If that's the big example we're using. Um, so it's going, now we're looking at how fast can you pay affiliates? And that's where a lot of self-hosted affiliate programs are probably like net 30 payment terms. And it's like a media buyer can't work with that. Like they need to return on their ad spend to reinvest it and keep scaling. And that's why we've rolled out uh, net for platinum clients. We can pay on a twice weekly basis. So they're getting a net three, net four payment cycle for everyone else. It's like a net seven getting paid the next Friday. So they will settle on a Wednesday. They'll get paid out on Friday. Usually it lands on a Monday or something. So like a net seven to 10, depending on how you cut it. Right. So usually even at our default setting, you're still getting paid faster than you would as an affiliate. Um, and we're taking the risk of like handling all the refunds and stuff still off their plates, but it's, a uh, yeah, it's like working with these media buyers. It's a lot of fun. It can be tough because they're not as tied to you as an agency is because you're not under contract. So they could just blow up your offer and it's all great. And then they leave. So <laughs> it's hard to build like, oh, wow, we're at this monthly run right now. Um, you kind of have to really work and make sure that the offer is converting at a good clip for them. And they kind of keep maintaining that. But when it works out, gosh, it's fun to watch. Yeah. So... I mean, that sounds awesome. And also, I think that's a great example of why you have lots of media buyer affiliates because there's no one paying them that fast anywhere else. So that mm -hmm. massively reduces the risk that they're taking because they know that they'll actually get money. And anyone who's been in this industry knows that there have been many, many historical scrubs where it keeps getting passed down. And yeah. just basically the publisher at the end is the one who has to eat so much losses just because someone didn't pay someone who was involved. Yeah. In That's the uh, fastest way to ruin relationships. Right. Is to screw up the payment flow. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, taking on net seven payments, like that's obviously a ton of risk for you. Mm -hmm. um, at what, at what point do customers get the option for that sort of thing for your customers? Oh, like an end client that's using it. Yeah. Clients. So actually I think, uh, yeah, any client now can get it. You used to, so like, if you're listening to this going, I thought ClickBank paid on like a net 14 cycle. That was the case 18 months ago, 12 months ago or so. Um, we've made a lot of room of, we've made a lot of effort to improve our payment speed because of the exact reason we're talking about cash flow is king in a lot of these cases, right? Um, and so default accounts are getting paid out. So it's like, it's a Wednesday through Tuesday settlement cycle when commissions and re refunds are coming out, all that kind of stuff settles on a weekly basis. And then um, we will pay that out on the next Friday or the, that Friday. So if it settles on Wednesday, you'll see the payment go out Friday, depending on your bank and international, all that it might settle, they might actually come in on Monday or something. Um, so anyone can get that. Um, and then the net three and four is for platinum clients and up. So that's for context, that's $250,000 a year in revenue on ClickBank. Yeah. 
that sounds nice, but to say the logistics, that must be difficult because there's always some like scrubbing and refunds and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that the, the good sure part that is that, yeah, no, you bring it up. I mean, the good part is that we've got almost a quarter century of experience um, and we have a good idea of like average refund rates across. And we've basically got thousands of sellers and affiliates promoting stuff. So we have like float essentially that can happen. Like if one offer goes down and that account went negative or something, um, we've got a lot more that are floating our books that we don't have to worry about versus someone who's doing it self-hosted and it's only theirs, right? So that's, the trust there is that we can still pay out the affiliate if that account goes negative, we have to go collect payments. We'll do that from whatever seller went negative or something. But overall, the platform is very healthy. So that's awesome. And that's a yeah. huge massive advantage. Yeah. And I think I think we've paid out over our history like five billion in commissions to affiliates. So it's been a we have a lot of historical record, right? Not that it's you know, future doesn't predict future, but we can kind of have a pretty healthy operating procedure. And we do watch like margin pretty closely um, as far as like what's going in and out. Cause that's right. Yeah. The, the risk is if sales stop overnight and refunds flood in, things can get upside down. So we do look at like, okay, this is trending down. Why is that happening? This chargeback rate is too high in this account. Why is that happening? So we are looking at that pretty closely on all these. And we have operating terms. You need to keep chargeback rates under 1%, uh, you know, refunds, I want to say 20 refunds don't impact mid as high as chargebacks do. Um, but there's different tiers. We're trying to incentivize and penalize people if they're going over those to get back down, things like that. But yes, yeah, so we do keep a very close watch on that. And our risk team is looking at account signups and active transactions at the same time. And we've got softwares that look at all that going, is this a risky looking transaction or does it look suspicious? Um, and same with signups. Is this something that we can, take or do we need to validate this further with our risk team and actually analyze a little bit more so we're validating both the account sign up from affiliate and seller standpoint and the actual customer that's actually purchasing mm -hmm. yeah. and it's a good example of sort of the value adds that only makes sense when you can do that sort of scale and those are things that are competitive advantages that are very hard to ever especially no newcomer is going to be able to do that yeah yeah no we, we priced it out like if you did everything ClickBank does. If you're like a $10 million, million dollar client kind of thing, if you did it all yourself compared to what ClickBank's fee is, which is 7.5% plus a buck per transaction, which people go, whoa, that's expensive to process. It's like, well, we're doing a lot more than just processing a payment, right? We're, especially when you're factoring all the affiliate volume and potential you're doing there. You know, it's a, it's a healthy clip if you try to do everything ClickBank does on the back end and try mm -hmm. to actually scale with that, especially mid transaction. We're getting nerdy now, but like, a good amount of business I win is people who just go, I can't work with Stripe anymore or PayPal because they got scared because I did $10,000 in a day when I used to do $1,000 a day. Like we are used to volatility. We have clients that do million dollar launches who have never done that before, right? And it's like, we're used to that volatility. We can handle it. We're not going to shut an account down because they sell too much. <laughs> it's like, that's a good thing in our world. So we like to work with that kind of space. And that's where people come and just go to the peace of mind that they can do scaled mids and processing without six months of history and escrow into a mid or something like that. Yeah, that's a good point too. Most people won't know until they run into it. But yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Your success can get you shut down really quickly. And then you you cut your success in pieces because no one wants to promote it if mm -hmm. they like are successful and then immediately stop being paid. Yeah. I mean, we're all marketers, right? People like to play offense and yeah. drive more sales and they rarely play defense and think about, okay, if Stripe turned off my processing, what do I do? Can I pivot fast enough? Or am I going to be on fire trying to cover, you know, this ad spend that went out the door when my cart was down or something, right? So it's like, what, what's that defensive piece you can play in all parts of your business that will keep that from happening, keep you in business. Yeah. Cool. And um, in terms of like the clients that you're seeing, they're the most successful. Um, what would you recommend in terms of their team structures that allow for mm, healthy yeah. and thriving affiliate programs? Mm, excuse me. Yeah. Um, it's so like I said, biz dev focused affiliate manager is huge. I think the mistake people make is like, Oh yeah, I hired affiliate manager and they are, they're almost hiring a glorified assistant where they're just like getting affiliates links and kind of answering questions passively. You want a salesperson in that role and then you can arm them with a virtual assistant or some sort of assistant to do that kind of like reporting, 
get people links kind of busy work. Right. But you want what you want an affiliate manager doing is selling and it's B2B sales at the end of the day. You're working with other businesses, you're trying to make a profit. So when you start structuring this team like a B2B partnership program or like a B2B um, sales program, it starts to make a lot more sense to people. It's like, oh, okay, so I need a biz dev focused affiliate manager. They're going out, they're shaking hands, kissing babies, building relationships. This space is so relationship driven. I cannot emphasize that enough. Like it's not just getting put up on a network. So it's going out and meeting people bringing people back to that affiliate manager, letting them close deals. When that deals close, it's actually having a process and program in place where, okay, this is going well. How do we go better and going deeper with your affiliates? It's 80, 20 rule, you know, Pareto principle applies to everybody and including an affiliate program. So yes, you might have, you might want an army of affiliates and you can build an army of affiliates, but even if you have a thousand affiliates promoting you, 10 of them are going to be driving most of your sales. That might be an extreme example, right? But um, it, it, we can, I can look at any data chart and show you that, right? It's like, so what are you going to go deeper to, to protect your biggest affiliates? And how do you kind of have that trickle down? And how do you identify the next diamonds in the rough that can become your top affiliates? What are those processes like? And that's what the top people are doing. They've got a business focused affiliate manager, at least one of them. And then they're building in actual processes and standard operating procedures for those types of questions and for that type of analytics with their data and going into that so that if when if and when that business that person leaves they can replace it with someone else and that structure is there the hard part is when people hire a good affiliate manager and rely on their networks and connections and send them to events and help them build more connections and don't build that sop and don't have a crm to track the affiliate leads and the connection points and the emails and the skypes and all that and that affiliate manager leaves and you just lost all that. <laughs> and now you're scrambling to hire someone else with all those connections. So what are you doing actually build those SOPs in place with that affiliate manager? Pass the, okay. Yeah, right. It's actually what's the actual business structure for that affiliate team is super important. Or you're just always trying, because at that point, then if they leave, you could hire just for a skill of a salesperson versus connections. And now I've got a Rolodex I can go mine. And as a salesperson, great, mm -hmm. right? I can start there. And now you can start to hire for skill versus connections. Well, mm -hmm. first you might've hired and needed to hire for connections because maybe that's what you needed first, right? But you need to be building that SOP in place. Um, I'd highly recommend, we've got some great episodes on our podcast with Amber Spears. I kind of talk a lot about that. Um, Amber Spears and East Fifth Avenue are great kind of affiliate trainers. I'll do a plug for them here. Like if you need to go listen to Amber or Alona Brudinsky, who are over there, um, highly recommend chatting with them. The next piece of that, right? I've, I alluded it to a bit, but it's the, does this team actually have resources? Too often affiliate teams are put on this island to figure it out with no real resources. <laughs> um, or, and they don't have enough leash to actually cut deals. And so every, every question that gets asked by an affiliate, the affiliate managers go ask the CEO or the CMO if they can do something. And then this delay process happens and affiliates are fast. They want something to work when they're, when they're interested, they're interested and needs to go now. So you need them to be able to know, here's the sandbox you can operate in. Here's our default commission. If someone can do X, pay them more, right? Up to this level. If things are getting outside of the sandbox we've built for this program, then come talk to me, right? And that's kind of the operating structure you want versus only do this and come to me for everything. You need to be able to give up some control to that team. Along with that and resources is that copywriting piece I mentioned before, right? Do they actually have a copywriter to roll out tests, changes on the offer? Um, is it a video production team? If you have a video sales letter or a webinar, like do they actually have things to test new hooks and leads into those to make new ad copy to test? Especially if you're working with media buyers, can be arming them with best creatives, can be getting email swipes that are fresh to people and subject lines to affiliates. Is it custom blog post or pages built? which goes into the tech piece, right? Do you have someone to actually help roll out those changes across the funnel that you're working on? So at when I, um, it's usually like three to four roles, right? Affiliate manager, copywriter, tech, kind of being the core three. And the fourth one is kind of that leader over that team, which might be the CEO or might be a CMO or something to actually get those questions answered quickly to arm them with the resources they need and get them what they need. Awesome. That's definitely a, a great uh, playbook for how to build the team properly. <laughs> cool. So we're running out of time. So just to sort of wrap it up, um, I know that you've kindly offered a free consultation for anyone who watches this video. Uh, where can they find more details about that and get in touch? 
Yeah, that is, oh gosh, what is the URL, URL for that? It should have in front of me here. I think it's go.clickbank.com slash Everflow. Uh, we'll also be sending this out to anyone who registered for this. Um, so it'll go out to everyone that way. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so if you go there, we've actually got some resources there that are, let me make sure that's right, actually. Yep, it is go.clickbank.com slash Everflow. We've got some resources there, some different guides and books we've done on building affiliate programs, kind of hiring affiliate managers or books for affiliate managers, if you are one. And if you scroll down that page, you'll see you can book a call with me, um, which, yeah, it's a pretty, you know, it's a more of a strategy consultation call around your business, your affiliate program, if you have one, or if you're thinking about building one, how to think about your offer, a lot of the stuff we've covered here, we'll kind of go through that. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Thomas McMahon. You can go to happyscaling.co, which is my blog I run if you want to kind of meet me there. Um, yeah, you can kind of find me all over social if you just want to chat that way. But that link I gave you is going to be the best place to go and kind of find the resources that we've built and kind of get in touch with me from here. Awesome. I want to shout out uh, Erica's comments about great webinar. Thank you so much for your time. You rock. I oh, thanks, Erica. Uh, echo that. Thank you for taking the time to share your expertise and um, talk about a bunch of stuff that you, you don't know until you know. And yeah. like, the, <laughs> if you build for this stuff sooner, it's so much easier to make it successful because it's really easy to get an affiliate program for a brand that's already doing well and have it grow right away and then just stop growing entirely because you don't have any structure to add on different types of partners and affiliates. You don't have payouts that allow more types of affiliates to be successful, all these things. And you don't have a way to protect them when they are seeing success. So I do think that these are the structural things that are sort of hidden to most people, but make the biggest difference towards making a, a, a program that continues to thrive. 100%. Yeah, it's the unsexy stuff that really bolster success long-term with this kind of thing and actually gets you off the ground in the first place. So it's not all just fun marketing copy and sales hacks, right? That's what gets the ball moving. But if you don't have the structure in place, it's, it's a struggle. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your time and hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Yeah, this is great. Thanks, Mike. And trust your event next week goes awesome. Yeah. Here's open. <laughs> <laughs>